Greetings, I am Shad, and you may have noticed that I use some wooden props uh, in my videos. You will have perhaps noticed that I have some uh, wooden sword replicas that I use um, as representations when I'm explaining certain facts about medieval stuff, sword stuff and things. Uh, you'll notice that I sit on a wooden chair um, in my videos, and you'll also notice that there's a shield behind my head, um, and uh, also another shield might have popped up now and then, my kite shield. I built all those things, and so I am about to start work on some more stuff. And I figured, well, if I'm going to be building things, I'm, you know, it's, you might appreciate me doing a, a how-to video on how I go about doing these things. And so, what I'll be making today is a heater shield because I I still need one. I have a, a nice big round shield. I've got a kite shield, but uh, now I need a heater shield. And so. Uh, it's going to be just a very simple how-to video. I'll put some commentary over so you see what I'm doing. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. It'll help you out. Maybe you could try doing something like this in the future if you want um, shields. Because buying these things, <laughs> as I found out, are, is quite expensive. Uh, so if you want to go about, you know, having practicing HEMA or whatever that you like to do and you wanted a, a historically historical accurate uh, representation shield uh, to use with it, you need to fork out a decent amount of money. And, and oftentimes, the other thing that I notice is that you can't really get the shield exactly the way you want. I mean, if you're the exact right size or the exact hand hold and other things like that, and so I found it's just easier to build one and uh, more cost effective as well. And so, if you like me, don't have a lot of money, but you want to be able to use a, a shield or whatnot in your uh, whatever you want to do reenactment, sparring, fighting. Uh, cosplay, whatever you want to do, uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to learn one or two things from this video, and so yeah, sit back and enjoy. To begin with, you're going to need some plywood. Now the plywood that I'm using here is about a centimetre thick. Now not all shields will uh, use such thick wood, and uh, of course traditionally they never even used plywood that <laughs> didn't exist back then. But uh, what we're doing here, we're making a historical approximation. Um, uh, and so, it's not to say it's historically accurate, but it's an approximation, which means that we want it to be as strong as a real historical shield, as, uh, as, uh, as heavy or as light in certain cases. And so, um, that's what we're going to be going for. Not all shields were uh, this thick. Um, it really depends on the type of shield that uh, you're making. The uh, Viking-like shields, the round shields, uh, they're generally thinner, much thinner than people suppose. And when you go to a, a kite shield, um, they can be a bit of both, but I, I believe that you want them to be a bit thi on the thinner side because both of those shields are much larger shields. But the heater shield is a smaller shield, and uh, they were made to be thicker. And as to why, well, I'll explain that in a later video. So once you have your plywood, you want to measure the shape. You actually want to measure out the shield. And so what you'll see that I'm doing here, I've measured 50, about 15 centimeters on the side down from the center point, and that'll give me the point of the kite shield. And uh, then I'm measuring the center all the way down, so that's kind of the spine. And, uh, and from that center, I'm going to be measuring the curve. And now there's a kind of a, there's a cool, cool trick or a um, technique you can use in measuring the bottom curved point of the shield. And what you do, you simply get a piece of string, stretch it from one end. Well, you first measure down from where you want the string to begin. And uh, you uh, measure for, or take that string to the furthest side of the shield and measure that down to the center. And what you'll notice there, if you do your measurements right, it'll line up perfectly. Um, or you, you, it should line up perfectly to that center line that you've drawn. And so by uh, stretching the string to the uh, very opposite end side, and then putting that down or uh, measuring it down uh, with a pencil to the center, you'll find it gives you a beautiful bottom curve and point for your heater shield, and the proportions will just look wonderful. So I'm a bit of a picky person and uh, I needed to measure it a couple of times just because uh, I wanted it to be the right size. I didn't want it to be too long or too short and so um, uh, you might have to try it a couple of times. I tried it a couple of times just to make sure I got it right. 
Um, and so, you know, you measure it, yeah, take a look, and, um, and then once you find a shape that you're happy with, well, then you progress on to cutting it. So, uh, the jigsaw. I love the jigsaw. The jigsaw is a wonderful tool. Um, uh, and uh, it's just, it's not, you know, when I say it's versatile, it's not versatile that it can do many things. All it does is cut, but it can do curving cuts, beautiful curving cuts. And so, I love the jigsaw. Out of probably any other tool, I use the jigsaw the most. So there you have it, There's the, you can kind of already see the beginning shape of the shield now with having cut that bottom part out and so, you know, against my arm you can kind of get an idea of what this is already going to look like. So the next step of course is to just jigsaw or cut off the top to get the peak of, uh, of your heater shield. And uh, look at that, that's pretty easy, I mean uh, just a couple of steps you already have very much what looks to be a shield um, so there's the shape that I went for and uh, against me oh, it's about the uh, it's a size I'm happy with and so that's the size I, I wanted it to be now before we continue uh, because the next step is of course to put the handle on the shield and I just want to kind of add a caveat before I continue because the way that I'm putting on the handle is not the way that you need to put on the handle okay there are a lot there are so many you know there's so many simple ways you can do this. You can just put a wooden handle on or just nail on some leather straps or, or you know, and so it can be very simple. Another simple way, you can buy like a cupboard handle, you know, kind of the cupboard handles you see on kitchen cabinetry and stuff. Um, some of them actually are a decent size that can substitute for a, a shield handle grip quite nicely. So there's, a, there's heaps of ways you can do it. Uh, so what you want to do is look at what the resources you have available to you and then work with the things that you have available uh, so for myself I actually had uh, available to me a, a forge yes a blacksmith forge and so that's what I used I decided to blacksmith uh, you know literally blacksmith my handles from some scrap metal now you do not need to do it that way like I said there are so many other simpler ways to do it, but I wanted to uh, do it this way for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's not not to get an authentic thing, no. It was uh, so I could make a handle the exact size and dimensions that I wanted it to be. I wanted a bit more freedom um, with, uh, you know, the grips that I was going to put onto the shield. And when I say freedom, I only was doing this because literally I had this available to me, and so, hey, I'm not going to complain. If it's there, I'm going to use it. Now there are a lot of uh, different uh, strap or handle configurations that you can put onto a shield and uh, after thinking about it I decided I wanted to go with a metal handle and hook which meant that you wouldn't have to tighten any buckles or straps you literally just put your hand in grab it and then you're good to go and so that's the configuration that I decided to go for with my heater shield and I decided to make them out of steel. And again, one more caveat before we continue, you know, when I say that, you know, it might sound fairly impressive or complex that I'm making this out of steel and I'm getting onto a blacksmith forge and working on this. I just want to say very clearly that I am a total noob when it comes to craftsmanship, okay? If I can do this, anyone can. I'm an amateur at every single thing that you're seeing me do here. Um, all you need is a basic understanding of design, geometry, and the basic, have an understanding of the basic principles of tools, and then you're good to go, and you can do this, literally. Like, this is the the second time I've only ever worked on this forge, okay? And so, you just work it out as you go. Also, if you're wondering who that uh, handsome, older gentleman, who that is, who's uh, kind of helping me out and everything, that's my dad. I'm, I'm doing all this at his workshop. I don't own any of, you know, these tools or anything like that. Uh, but my uh, dad is a, um, a well, yeah, he's a, he's a builder, lifelong tradesman and builder and architect and all that kind of stuff. And so he's collected all these tools over the years. And uh, so I have, ha I have the privilege to be able to use them. Um, uh, and so I help myself to uh, his, uh, his equipment and, and uh, stuff. And so yeah, the uh, all the tools are his, the forge is his. Uh, uh, this is this is um, the home that I grew up in. I grew up as as a kid, um, and so I'm working in uh, my dad's workshop here. 
Now, once you have the fire started in the forge, um, you need to let it burn a bit to get the heat heat uh, going and raising. And so, once that while that is going, I get my scrap iron, or scrap steel, and I cut it to size. And, um, two lengths uh, are good. Um, and uh, what I'm using here is kind of like a drop angle grinder, like a drop saw, but it, it's for metal, for steel. <laughs> and it looks pretty cool as it's going there. Uh, look at that, pretty good. And so yeah, just cut the second piece out. Now once the fire's going, you chuck it in there and uh, let it heat up. And, and so I'm not, like I said, this is not complex. Uh, we're not doing anything complex here. There's my dad kind of um, giving me a head start on it. And so just heating it up and banging it into a, a shape. And uh, well, that shape is just banging, banging an angle on it. So there's a little bit of fiddling. Well, I found that there was a little bit of fiddling to get the, the shape. Um, uh, and when I say exactly right, I did not get anything exactly right here, but get the shape at least passable for it to function the way I want it. And so um, it's, a, there's a, it's a combination of bending and hammering and uh, just tinkering as you go. See, and that's kind of the, my first attempt, and uh, it looks like a handle, when you look at it, it's very handle-like, but the, the shape is very, very um, disproportioned. It's not even on either side, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's close enough, and so, yeah, uh, I just do a little bit more tinkering to get it a bit closer uh, to a passable um, a shape to function for the handle of a shield. Now this is my second attempt. I learned a bit from the first and so I worked at uh, making those uh, sides more even um, and also to make the handle closer to where my uh, fist would be on the shield. And look at that, that is much more even than my first attempt so I was a bit, bit happy with that, uh, happier than my first attempt anyway. Now. Now you get to see the results. This was my first attempt, the first handle that we did, and you'll notice that it's uneven and also it's far too big. So uh, if I was, uh, look how far the handle rests above my hand. I actually need to raise my hand to grab a hold of it, so that's not going to work at all. My second attempt worked out much, much better. Um, uh, the uh, handle portion of it is closer to the shield. I can wrap my fist around it nicely, and so resting my hand right against the shield I can slide it in and grab the handle and uh, right where it needs to be so that works out much much better and so you can see the kind of difference so my first attempt was a bit of a fail but I salvaged that first attempt I, I decided I'm gonna use that first attempt as the hook that's gonna hook over my um, forearm uh, near the, the my elbow joint and so with uh, the the my first attempt being the hook and the f my second being the handle. Now it's a matter of aligning it on the shield for where I'm going to be fixing it to the shield. So um, I want it to, you know, in, put out the center portion of the shield and uh, there's a bit of measurement to make sure it, it's in the right position. So that back hook there is actually the, uh, the what, what's left of my first attempt. I put it on the forge to put a new shape in it and um, uh, and then also cut off one end and so it's perfect for the back hook now. So once I uh, pick the uh, positions of uh, where I'm gonna put the handle and hook I need to drill the holes and of course first of all when you're using any type of power tool you want protection. 
safety gog safety glasses and goggles and all that good stuff. And so then it's a matter of lining up where you want the, those holes and uh, drilling them. And so this is uh, this is obviously it's a metal drill. I don't even know the proper name. See how much of a noob I am? I don't even know the names of the tools I'm using. But anyway, so yeah, lining up and uh, and uh, drilling the holes. Look at that. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Wow, well, I'm I'm happy with it. <laughs> I'm easily impressed. So once you uh, you have those holes drilled, and again you don't need to do this. You could just um, uh, you know use wooden handles or leather straps or whatever. Uh, but I uh, drill through the hole on my metal handle right into the wood, so the holes will line up perfectly. And look at that, the screws just slide in without a problem. So. Uh, I was very happy with how this is all working. Now the next part, I want the um, I'm using uh, nuts and bolts here, and uh, of of course nuts and bolts are not historically accurate. Again, remember this is a historical approximation. It's not uh, we don't want to make a historical replica. Okay, um, and so I'm I you would not use nuts and bolts if um, a shield was thinner. I, I could not do this with my Viking shield because the wood is far too uh, thin, and that means the uh, screw heads would jut out on the on top. And so I'm using um, nuts here, nuts and bolts here, because uh, the wood is thick enough for me to uh, drill them a bit further into the wood and have them flush with the top so the top will be completely smooth. And so the way I go about doing this is literally just drilling out the top kind of layer of uh, the, the, the screw holes that I've already um, uh, screwed in there or uh, drilled in there. And so the same diameter as uh, the uh, bolt head and so um, uh, that is going to sit in there perfectly and it's going to be uh, flush with the shield top. Now you want it to be a tight fit, you don't want um, there to be much slack on the ends and so because it's a nice tight fit, just needed to hammer them in a little bit to make them very flush with uh, the top and I did actually want them sticking out like half a mil from the top because when I tighten them, when I tighten the um, the nut onto the, onto the bolt, um, it's going to pull that bolt into the wood a little bit to make it really tight and so I left a little bit of slack on the uh, on the face of the shield um, so when I tighten it it'll go perfectly flush and the, the, um, uh, the joint will be really tight. Now look at this, look at that, that's exactly what I wanted, I wanted a quick grab um, so you don't need to you fiddle with straps or anything, just grab it straight on and then you're holding it and uh, the way it's built, uh, this is the advantage of heater shields, any type of strap shield, you have full articulation with the shield. You can rotate your wrist and the shield rotates perfectly and the whole thing is braced against your arm and so you're able to take much bigger hits. So that's what the um, my handle and metal uh, hook looks like and uh, it all works pretty good. I'm quite happy with that. Now, uh, look, just in and grab it. So that's why I picked this configuration for speed. You just pick it up and you're good to go. Something else that I was happy with, and this is intentional, is that there's enough room on the handle to hold something else. Um, specifically, the reins of a horse. Um, these shields are used on horseback as much as anything else, and so there you go. Now, pay attention to where I actually put the, the handle and hook. Are on the shield because you'll notice that I didn't center them perfectly and that again is intentional because what you want to be centered is your forearm you want your forearm and fist to be centered on the shield and so to do that you need to position the handle and hook a bit off center to each other and so take a close look and you'll see the proportions of where I where I place this to make sure my forearm is centered when I'm holding it and so the hook is placed further in from the side of the shield as opposed to the handle so this is all very intentional and the reason why the hook needs to be further in is for your elbow the your elbow joint forearm because you'll have some space and then you're gonna hit where your elbow is and so that's the beginning of your forearm or how to get your arm to be fully centered on the back of the shield
Now, heater shields are thick shields. They get most of their strength literally from the thickness of the wood, whereas older shields, or th sorry, not older, but thinner shields, because you can have thinner shields in this period as well, they got their strength from having rawhide stretch over the, t the front. Now, you can have rawhide over the front of a heater shield, and I'm sure that was done historically as well, but it was also not done historically because, like I said before, you get ample strength and protection um, just from the, the thickness of the wood. And so if I was to try and make an approximate, a historical approximate, um, and I did this with my Viking shield, bear in mind, Mind, because my Viking shield is much thinner, is that to get an approximate, you you slather glue over the face of the shield, and then you stretch material, just normal material, over on top of that on top of that glue. And so, when that dries, it hardens really, really good, and becomes really tough, and it becomes a decent enough approximation of rawhide, and it gives a huge amount of strength to thinner shields which they need that strength because my viking shield is only like two mil thick and so even a blunt sword could uh, go through that um, and so yes they need the strength of rawhide and the way you get an, a, a modern analog without needing to go to the trouble of using real rawhide is glue and material but I'm not doing that with this shield. I'm just showing you in case you want to do that with any shields you make in the future. I'm just happy with the thickness of this shield as is. And so my next step is, is of course sanding it. And so I just get a nice belt sander out and go over it several times and it makes it really nice and smooth. Um, and it even sands down some of those bolts if they were protruding a little bit more. And of course sand the edges to make them smooth as well. The next step is a completely optional step, just like the having actual steel handles. That, that's completely optional as well, because the the shield, as you see it right now, could be you could consider it very well done. All you need to do is paint it up, and you're good to go. It's done, all right. But I, I'm a bit of a, a not well. I say perfectionist. I just you know I like things to be. Uh, good. <laughs> I, I, well, that's surprising. Everyone likes things to be good, but. You know what I'm saying, and and so what I wanted to do, I wanted a metal, I want to, yeah, a metal rim around my shield, and I've done it with all my other shields, and so I'm putting a metal rim around uh, my heater shield, and it's not really, you know, for function though, it would make it a little bit strong, but I'm using tin, and tin is really, really weak stuff. I mean, yes, it's metal, but it's not strong, and so though it would add a little bit of strength to the shield, it, it's not a huge amount. What I'm really doing it for is for looks because it looks awesome and so I'm just using some scrap tin here and uh, just literally uh, tracing the edges of the shield for where I'm going to uh, snip it I use tin snips to cut this stuff out and oh boy is that a workout on the wrists but yeah so you measure it and uh, once you have the measurements then you're good to cut now, of course, before you even get to um, putting on this metal rim, and uh, and if you're not even going to be doing a metal rim, because like I said, it's optional, you need to paint it. And painting is an essential part, although well, it's not essential, but you really want to paint a shield. It'll look kind of poxy, or not very good, without it being painted. And so, I'm, uh, I just like the four-quartered checkered pattern and so I uh, um, divided into four quarters measured it out with a ruler I uh, paint along the edges with a smaller brush so I can make that line um, a, a bit sharper um, and so once I paint along with a smaller brush I go over it with a bigger brush now I'm doing it in this order because for one I wanted to measure up um, uh, the the borders of my shield so I could uh, um, uh, cut the tin net you know, the right way. I need to do that before I painted it, of course. Um, or you could do it after you paint it. I just didn't want to have to wait until it was dry. Uh, so I measured up before I paint. Uh, but then I put the rim on after it's painted, of course. Um, uh, because you don't want to paint over your metal rim or anything like that. Yeah, so, you know, once it's painted, you uh, cut those uh, the rim that you've pre-measured out of the, your tin and, uh, and so 
careful of sharp bits when doing this because the, the off cuts are very very sharp they will uh, poke you and draw blood very very easily so yes yeah, just be careful of that and use gloves right use gloves and you're lucky that this is fast forwarded because uh, it's a bit of a timely process and you'll see me pausing there I'm shaking my hand because it's getting so sore this is a workout on your hand grip my goodness There you go, so that's the first strip cut off. Now, you will have noticed that there is a line down each of the strips that I have cut. So that line is there to uh, tell me that w how much of this strip is going to be sitting on the shield and how much is sitting off. Because that portion that is sitting off the shield, well, you'll see what I'm going to do with it later on. So I'm sure you're enjoying watching the, you know, sped ups of the, you know, the fast forwarding of this, seeing me work away hard, but so while you're watching and uh, there's a bit of a pause, I am going to go make a sandwich. Mmm, mmm, oh yeah, sorry, just, just uh, chewing there, but, um, oh, we haven't even come to that, so I'll, I'll finish my sandwich, hang on. Mmm, that was good ham, yes. Tasty. Ah, now, I mentioned that it's a workout on the hands. Gee, do you see that red there? That kind of, uh, it's flaring up already from all the pressure that we're putting on the hand. Yeah, ouchies. It's certainly a workout. Next, we're going to be putting on a metal rim. And so it's, it's going to be... Uh, uh, holding to the shield in multiple different ways, glue primarily. So you chuck the glue on and then uh, you use some um, uh, hand clamps to hold it in place. And so now you get to see what I'm going to do with that portion that's hanging off. So what I do, I cut into uh, the tin making little tags along the edge of the shield. So you don't cut any further into the part that's actually sitting on the shield, you're only cutting the part that's resting off the shield and so you make tags and then what you do, you get some pliers and you bend with the pliers and sometimes just with your hand as well, you bend those tags down and around the edge of the shield and so that will help hold the uh, this uh, metal rim to the shield and then the glue will finish the job. See, there you go. See how I've bent those tags um, down over the edge of the shield and then under all along there? And uh, you'll see that uh, it looks pretty good. The finished result looks pretty darn good. And so then it's just a simple matter of uh, rinse and repeat. You do that with all the other edges. I love hand clamps. Hand clamps are awesome. You know, you can never have too many hand clamps. True. It's a true thing. I'm serious. Hand clamps. You can never have too many. Do you think I've used enough? Nah, I think I might need some more. If I want to hold on those other metal rims, I'll certainly need some more hand clamps. And of course, what you're seeing me do here is the exact same thing before. I'm cutting those tags into the edge of the metal rim and then bending those tags over the edge of the shield. So in the process of me putting this uh, metal rim around the shield, I was not happy with where the top corner was sitting, and so uh, I needed to redo it, and that, that was a bit fiddly. You don't want to have to redo it, but, you know, you do what you need to do. And I got it in, the, in a, an, a passable position, an acceptable position. Like I said, none of this is perfect. None of it is lining up perfectly at all. But I'm just making it to a passable standard that, uh, and that standard is my standard, where I'm happy um, with the quality or uh, I can accept the quality. That might be enough hand clamps. Maybe. Maybe there's enough. 
with your rim on and the tags all bent around the sides so you have that metal rim literally going along the entire border of your shield it's a matter of waiting for that glue to dry and uh, so you can come back later or whatnot but once it's dry you're free to take off those clamps and uh, there you have it then the, the shield has a metal rim what you need to be careful about when you're putting on this metal rim is uh, the spiky pokey parts of the tin, specifically on the underside. Th those tags that you cut in on the edges of the shield, those can be very spiky and so you need to um, do something to make uh, the shield safe. And so what I do is that I cover the edges of the, the rim in silicon. And that silicon also acts as an additional glue holding the rim even like in a very, very firm way to the shield. And silicon is great. It has a very rubbery kind of texture, rubbery finish. And so that covers all the spiky, dangerous parts of the tin and metal, making the shield completely safe and it gives it its kind of final finishing touch. And so once you have that, the, when, you, when you have uh, the rim fully uh, glued by glue and silicon to uh, the shield and all the spiky parts um, uh, covered, it's done! There you go! That's what it looks like. That is the heater shield. Uh, with a metal rim all around with uh, metal handles and again you don't need to do the metal rim or the handles you can just do leather straps uh, but gee it looks good well I think it looks good I'm very happy with the, uh, the final the end result there and I hope you have enjoyed watching and I wish you all the best if you go forward in the future and endeavor to try and make a, a shield and if you use any of the advice or, or uh, um, have learned from the demonstrations that I've been able to show here well, that gratifies me greatly. It's good to know that I've been able to help in some small way. And please do stick around because one of the very reasons why I'm making this shield is to do videos on, on shields as to how they were used, how they evolved, how did, you, how did the round shield and why did the round shield evolve into the kite shield and why did the kite shield evolve into the heater shield that you got to see me make here. You will find videos on my channel touching on those topics, addressing each individual shield and you'll also get to see the shields that I've made um, if you want to take a look at them. So again, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed.